the seating situation, we've tried uh, persistently to get the wall open to expand our seating capacity. And as uh, you want, we all know, technology can be our friend, but today um, it's not being as generous to us. So um, please bear with us. I think it'll be uh, worth the inconvenience. Um, let me welcome you to University 90. Um, on behalf of the Center for Energy Research, Education, and Service, our lecture today is a diversified uh, or a diverse person indeed. He has uh, among his skills, he is an architect, an industrial designer, an advanced system inventor. He is the director of the Sasakawa International Center for Space Architecture. He is a professor of architecture at the University of Houston. He is the board chairman of Bell and Trotty, an aerospace research and design firm, and the co-founder of Space Industries Incorporated, also a private firm. Uh, they are currently developing an orbiting space laboratory scheduled for launch on the space shuttle in 1992. His personal work, the work of his center and students, includes design and planning for space stations, planetary outposts, polar stations, ocean communities, theme park exhibits, movie sets, and simulators. So as you see, his, uh, his site parameters truly meet the university theme of uncommon ground. I know he has some roots in the Midwest in that he born and raised in Wisconsin and attended the University of Illinois. So please join me in a warm Midwestern welcome to Larry Bell. First slide, please. Can someone tell me if this slide's upside down? First, I'd like to thank you for an introduction for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, I'd like to thank the College of Architecture and to thank Cirrus. I'd like to thank uh, Bob Kester for his hospitality and Jeff Culp and all the others I've met here at this, at this university and at this college. I truly appreciate the invitation. Perhaps I might start by stating that I believe space conjures up many interesting and very powerful images that vary with different individuals. And I think most of us have multiple images of what the word space conjures. We think of movies like Space Odyssey. We think of Star Wars programs. We think of uh, movies like E.T. where at least we have a friendly alien for a change. Some of you in architecture, perhaps other fields, uh, you may conjure images of space colonies, uh, many traceable to Gerard O'Neill in Princeton, colonies for thousands of people living in perhaps spinning habitats, cities away from Earth. 
for probably most of us, it conjures images of Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, walking on the moon for the first time, planting American flags. It conjures images of astronauts working in zero gravity, cosmonauts. It conjures the images of the power of the shuttle being launched. More recently, perhaps the deafening silence of the shuttle sitting on the launch pad with maintenance problems, which affects, again, the way we perceive space and the space program. Clearly, space affects our national image, our national pride, our identification with adventure, the symbol of technological competence and complexity associated with the space program. Space inspires and supports quest for knowledge about our universe, our solar system, our planet. Space programs and science raise questions and possibilities related to our relationships as humans, our human species, within the natural order of the universe. Space, space provides a, is that better? I'm sorry. Space provides a viewing stage for observing our planet. From space, both with unmanned programs as well as the manned programs, we begin to see changes in our environment that are influenced by human activities, populations, technologies. We see from space that the Earth is a very fragile Earth ecosystem, that the atmosphere is not nearly as thick as we imagine it to be from Earth, standing on the surface. We view, we view the Earth from space, and we realize that international borders dissolve, and we see the Earth as an international community. Space provides incentives to develop and evaluate potential, potentially beneficial technologies, both for Earth and for space. It provides experiences that examine and test the abilities of humans to adapt to new situations and to harsh environments, to perform under difficult circumstances. Space can potentially promote and support new international initiatives because space programs tend to be very expensive programs, too expensive even for the wealthiest countries when we began thinking about going to other planets. And so space both symbolically as well as economically encourages international cooperation, and I, and I suspect we're going to see more evidence of that in the future. Because through international programs, we can not only share the burdens, but we can share the benefits of exploration programs. Largely due to carelessness on my part in defining the title for this lecture, uh, I realize that there's perhaps good reason for misinterpreting my perspective about what I like to do for a living. The, the lecture title said Designing for Life Beyond Earth, and I probably should have said Design for Living Beyond Earth. And the importance of this distinction, and I believe that, that this distinction is probably is, is, is uh, a reason that prompted a, a very thoughtful letter I received from one of the students here, Vern Allen Stanley, that talked about, uh, raised some very interesting questions and some important ones, that I think for many people, perhaps, they think of space as, and we think of space architecture, space colonization, it's kind of an escapist view that, well, once we fall up the Earth, we can go off into space and create artificial environments that have, uh, you know, there are places where future people will colonize and just the good people will go there and we won't, we won't screw them up like we are on our own planet. 
and there's this, this kind of escapist view, I think, of, of, of uh, space as a refuge for those of us who are concerned about the future of the Earth. Uh, this is not a motivation, this is not a strong uh, motivation on my part. I don't believe I'd like to live in a space colony. Uh, I'm really very happy on Earth. Uh, I think we all have a great investment in its future. And our work in space really has to do with with supporting human programs, both in low Earth orbit and planetary programs, that uh, support useful science and they, and they support uh, progress, whatever progress means, in, in the field of technological development and, and economic benefits to Earth. I believe that space and in general, the space programs and the manned programs in particular are inevitable. I think they're inevitable because I believe there's a little child in most of us that wants, that, that wants to explore, wants to know more about their environment and their broader environment, the neighborhood, which is the solar system and beyond. And I also believe that we as architects, designers, problem solvers uh, can make very real and very significant contributions to these, these uh, programs of human exploration. Space, uh, the, the human exploration programs that, that are the programs that we are focusing increasing attention upon have strong endorsements from the, the previous and current White House administration. On January 5th, 1985, President Reagan committed the United States to the development of a space station in his State of the Union address. Now, many of us have been working with concepts for space station and requirement definition for space station long before that time, but that was the first U.S. public announcement that we were going to commit to a space station program. And, and quoting from the State of the Union address of the President, President Reagan, we can follow our dreams to distant stars, living and working in space for peaceful economic and scientific gain. Tonight I am directing NASA to develop a permanently manned space station and to do it within a decade. So currently the space station program is, uh, is moving ahead, uh, not as e economically and effectively as many of us would like to see it move ahead, but it, it clearly is going to be a reality. President George Bush gave his support to a space station as part of a broader U.S. space program for the next decade and beyond. On July 20th, 1989, which was the 20th anniversary of the date that uh, humans first set foot on the moon, he presented his administration's plan, and I quote it from, from his address, for the 1990s space station freedom, our critical next step in all our space endeavors. And next, for the new century, back to the moon, back to the future, this time back to stay. And then a journey into tomorrow, a journey to another planet, a manned mission to Mars. So plans for uh, exploration of Mars are very much part of our national agenda now, as well as a resettlement, you know, a permanent settlement on the moon uh, is part of the White House agenda we have to wait and see whether Congress will back this up uh, as the White House is strongly urging. In presenting this discussion this afternoon, I'm going to show you lots of pictures. And uh, I'd like you to, I, I really should explain that uh, these pictures are largely products, in fact, they're, they're, well, they're, they're, they're largely products of two organizations I'm associated with. Bell and Trotty Incorporated, which is our private firm uh, that is doing quite a lot of design work for Space Station Freedom, and also work that's come from the Sasakawa International Center for Space Architecture. That's quite a mouthful. We call it SIXA. Uh, work that has come from our, our program at SIXA and our graduate program in experimental architecture, which is supported uh, and really operated by SIXA. It's a graduate program. Uh, it la students are, attend the program for one or two years, depending upon their backgrounds coming into the program. 
So a lot of the slides, in fact, virtually all of them I'm going to show you are products of one of, one of those two organizations. Uh, I, do not, not, I do that not just to promote our organizations, but I think to, to share with you my perspective that uh, uh, we as, as practicing architects and designers uh, are involved with the space program and to help to put that involvement perhaps a little bit more into focus for you today here. This is a, a painting done by Denise Watt, done for Bell and Trotty, actually done uh, by our firm for NASA. It's a painting you may have seen that shows the ultimate configuration that's planned for Space Station Freedom. I'm going to kind of give you a tour, a quick tour through the space station. I'm going to try to talk a little bit about uh, some of the some of the special considerations in designing for low Earth orbit, which is the orbit the space station goes into and some of the considerations that uh, we consider in, in thinking of planetary bases on the Moon or Mars. But essentially, the space station is, is uh, small modules. They're like thermos bottles. They're pressurized modules, about 15 feet in diameter, about 42 feet long. And they're put into what we call a, a racetrack configuration, which is to say there's circulation around the modules in case, and to, to provide dual egress in case there's a, a problem in one, one area, people can escape to another area, and that's, that's a very important safety precaution. In this complex of modules, which includes a, a principally a, a laboratory module and, and a habitation module, there's also a module that's being developed by, by Japan the Japanese experiment module, which is, an, which is an orbiting laboratory module, and also a module being developed by the European Space Agency, which is a laboratory module largely devoted to life sciences experiments. So this is an international venture. Uh, we call the U.S. part of the venture the U.S. The, the space station freedom. Space station was originally designed as having a rather large infrastructure uh, that, that can be used for attachment of uh, experiments. It can be used for attachment of a large hangar for vehicles that will be going perhaps to the moon and other, and other destinations, antennas, and so on. Uh, also, it has, for the, those of you who are in, interested in power systems, it has a photovoltaic power system, which is part of the baseline design for the first phase, and later on, uh, a solar concentrator, solar dynamic power system that's, that is planned to be added later. The modules are rather small, as I mentioned, and really they're, like, they're kind of like house trailers. We think of space as being very vast, but most space architecture really deals with, with uh, very small volumes. Here's, this is another view. Please understand that the trusses are there just for the model. Uh, but this is the habitation laboratory, U.S. module, the laboratory module, again, the GEM, the Japanese module, ESA, with an external experiment facility. These are resource nodes that provide circulation. There should, actually would be a couple on this end as well. And a logistics module, which brings expendable supplies up and down. It's kind of a, a storage room for the space station. This is a... This is a, a painting we did for Boeing when they were competing for what's called Phase CD, the development phase of the space station. And it shows a reasonably up-to-date view of what the interior looks like of the space station. Uh, there are sleeping quarters uh, at one end, and it's designed for a crew of about six people. One of the interesting things about space station and, and any low Earth orbit facility uh, something that really significantly impacts design is we don't have gravity. The space station is always falling around the Earth. And so, relatively speaking, inside the space station, you don't experience gravity. You experience microgravity, which is if you're doing very sensitive instrumentation, there might be 10 to the 6 or 10 to the mi minus 7, uh, 10, 10 to the minus 6 or 10 to the minus 7 gravity levels, very minute gravity levels. But for, for, but for purposes of living there, it's a weightless environment. That has some pretty significant impacts. For one thing, 
we, can, we don't sleep in beds in a space station because beds would take up a lot of room and you don't have to lie down to sleep. You're much more comfortable sleeping in a sleeping bag attached to a wall. You can literally drift off to sleep in space. Uh, you, can, you can go to sleep one place and wake up another place. Uh, you find that sleeping styles are highly individualistic. Some people don't, you know, some people are very comfortable kind of drifting away and sleeping and, and, and waking up somewhere else. Some people, on the other hand, like to have the sense of clothing. They like to have coverings. They actually sleep with, with straps over them and their, their head is strapped back so it doesn't slip forward and, and something that, that simulates the, the, the feeling of, of a covering. Uh, we don't sit in chairs in space because sitting in chairs would, would require, first of all, uh, gravity. You know, you have gravity holding you in your chairs, those of you who are lucky enough to have a chair here. Uh, and the gravity also not only secures you to the chair, but it holds your body bent. Now, if you were to try to sit in space, you'd have to tense your abdominal muscles to, to hold your body bent, which is, which is work. It's uncomfortable. Or, or tying your shoe, bending over, is uncomfortable because you don't have gravity to assist you. So sitting in, in chairs is, is, is uncomfortable. In fact, we don't sit at all. Uh, we, we don't need chairs because uh, if you have a foot restraint and your, your feet are secured, uh, that's perfectly adequate. You're, you're totally comfortable in that position. Your body goes into kind of an S shape, it's sort of sort of like this. Your shoulders go forward. You're, 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 you go into kind of a position that's called a neutral buoyancy position, which is like if you were in a swimming pool and you were weighted so that you're neither sinking nor rising in the swimming pool. That's the body. That you're, you're, that's the position your body goes into in a relaxed state. That's the comfortable position in space. And because you don't have gravity. Uh, your envelope, I might mention one thing, your body gets longer. You may not know it, but you're about a half an inch taller when you wake up in the morning than you are at night when you go to bed. Sometimes I feel a lot shorter than that after I've had a hard day. I feel like I've been ground down to about a foot shorter than I am when I wake up in the morning. But uh, that's because you don't have gravity compressing your spinal column. Your, and your spinal column overnight relaxes and gets longer and, and during the daytime it starts compressing back. And that, in space, that can be as much as two inches a day, or two inches, rather, overall. So the, you're, you're longer, but at the same time, you're shorter because you're in your neutral buoyancy position. Which means, for example, if you don't have gravity, having a table with a horizontal top makes no sense at all, because things will drift away whether the table's horizontal or tilted. It means that since you're not sitting in a chair, the, the table probably wants to be closer to your face and probably a tilted surface. It means that if you're eating peas on a spoon, the only thing holding the peas to the spoon is the surface tension of the water and the peas in the spoon. So if, you, if you're having a very lively conversation while you're eating the peas and you pause with the spoon halfway in a thought, the peas will not stop. They will continue on their trajectory towards your face. <laughs> and so, and so we, we, we learn to eat in a different way. And, and I've always believed that probably eating with, with, with chopsticks, which I like anyway, uh, is, is probably a pretty good way to do it. I enjoy chopsticks because I, I tend to taste things more. I'm eating more slowly, deliberately, and so on. But actually, you're grasping things. But it affects the way you do most things. The, the, uh, if, if your feet are secured to the floor in space, and you're working at a workstation, you don't have a center of gravity. Uh, in, in other words, in, in, if, if I were doing this on, the, on Earth, and I reached too far, and my, my shoes were nailed to the floor, uh, it would put a great deal of stress on my ankles, and it would be very painful, not to mention the fact that it would probably break my ankles as, as I fell over. In space, you don't have a center of gravity, so you can reach much further. You can reach behind you, you can reach forward. Uh, if you're not secured, ceilings can be workspaces just as, just as walls and floors can be. So in other words, if, if this were a, a gigantic space station, uh, you, know, you could, you could uh, you can use the ceilings as readily for workspaces as you can for floors and so on. So that has the advantage that since these volumes are very, very small and very, very expensive, measured in terms of billions of dollars, fully utilizing every square, every cubic foot or every cubic inch of that volume is very important, but you have the added benefit of being able to take advantage of, of weightlessness to, to accomplish this. In space, your body changes because of other physiological factors that affect your body. The blood that on Earth is pulled down into your feet and into your legs and other body fluids comes pooling up into your chest, into your face. 
because your because your chest is full of a lot of fluids, your lungs don't have as much room to 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 expand into. Your face becomes puffy when you when you feel like you have chronic nasal congestion. And your facial movements aren't as aren't as agile. You might you might uh, might be harder to smile. So if you're telling a joke, your counterpart might not know it's a joke, and you have the risk of serious injury from being punched out because uh, he under he misunderstands or she misunderstands what you're saying. You know, communication is affected. Uh, muscles, because they're not being used as much, tend to atrophy. The the, the heart is a muscle; it loses its lot much of its strength. You, your calf muscles decrease in strength. Calcium leaches from your bones, become more brittle, just like bed rest patients on Earth have, have this, this phenomenon. So, so there are physiological changes, some of which impact design and, and some of which demand uh, emphasis on exercise to try to counteract these changes. And exercise can be very expensive because it takes a lot of time. It's expensive in terms of crew time, inconvenient, boring, etc. And we need to devise ways to make exercise effective and enjoyable. Weightlifting doesn't work very well without gravity, but using uh, other types of exercise uh, procedures, exercycles, and, and rowing machines, and so on, do make a certain amount of sense. Living in space, you're 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 in a very confined environment. Uh, I spent a year in Greenland, when a small base with about a hundred people, and. and and I can somewhat appreciate the problem, but if, if, there's a, if there's an interpersonal dispute with someone, you can't get away from it. You're, you're constantly confronted with that individual. Things don't quite get resolved. As, as days and weeks and months go on, uh, you, you, you lose sensitivity to, to things. You, you need more light stimulation. You, uh, you, you tend to become careless sometimes. You, you tend to become restless. Uh, Part of it might become due to physical deconditioning that, that, that's occurring. And you're confined in a very small environment where uh, you have limited, limited equipment. If something breaks down, it's a long way to the hardware store to get a replacement part. If someone's ill, uh, the whole, and particularly if it's something that's contagious, the whole crew is at risk. If someone is incapacitated due to illness. It means other people have to take over their, their job, which means a great deal of cross-training. So, so the importance of human productivity because of the tremendous expense of operating uh, has, has enormous economic and, and, and functional implications. So the, I mentioned the sleeping quarters. In this case, the sleeping quarters are, are all the way around the, the pressure hall. They go, there's some that are located this direction looking down, some that are on the floor looking, you know, in kind of a normal position, some are standing up to, to create a, a kind of a sleeping environment that's the private environment, the quiet environment of the, of the space station. Uh, the sleeping quarters are the only place you have privacy. They're the only place you can escape, get away to, uh, perhaps listen to music. Uh, of course, maybe you can do this with, 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 this, with a Walkman or something, uh, but it's your place where, where you're the only place you have privacy to escape to, and even though they're sort of broom closet size, very small, again, having all the accommodations necessary is very important. We're looking at the back here of a, of a personal hygiene area where, where people wash and, and there's a shower here. Uh, Bell and Trotty designed the sleeping quarters for Boeing and the, and the personal hygiene area for Grumman, and, and we're currently developing the, the galley the food preparation galley and the wardroom area for ILC space systems that's a Boeing contractor. But the, the, the notion of how is food prepared and, and who prepares the food. We don't have very good maid service in space and so everybody has to pitch in. Uh, space stations are absolute petri dishes for every kind of bio, every kind of critter that, you know, uh, bio, microbiology, bio, biological critter that you can think of growing and so we're very concerned about hygiene. How do you keep it clean? How do you access all the areas for cleaning? Uh, there's a small medical clinic inside the space station and where we can respond to medical emergencies. And one of the big problems is defining, well, what, what level of emergency do you, do you attempt to provide for? We're, we're certainly not going to be doing surgery in a space station. It's not hygienic enough. We don't have the surgical skill people there to do it. 
There's also problems if you cut into somebody and the blood spurts, it's just going to keep going. It doesn't have a nice trajectory like it does on Earth and, and, and a, lot of, a lot of complications. But we do have to have means of responding to, to major emergency issues. Uh, windows are very, very important. Uh, the Skylab experience demonstrated to us that the most popular activity for leisure time is looking out the window. In space, uh, there's nothing as exciting as watching this, the Earth move underneath you and, and, and observing the Earth. If we go to lunar bases, and I'm going to talk about that later, the problem of windows is problematic because we're, the, the, in all likelihood, the modules can be covered with Earth to, to protect us from radiation. And so we, we may not have that viewing opportunity, and that has big psychological implications. This is a, a galley we're, we're working on now uh, for the space station. I mentioned with ILC space systems. It's uh, the, the basic units of a space station in terms of the interior are, are, are racks. Racks are uh, 48 inches wide. They're, they're units that fit into the walls and ceilings and floors that have all the equipment items in them. The other units are called functional units. Those are units that, that people go into, and, and the functional units fit into the same modular pattern that the racks do. And so the space station is very modular so that you can take out racks and you can, you can change and reconfigure the interior. Uh, surfaces are, we've designed them to be very flat, easy to clean, <clears throat> try to minimize crevices where things can, can get caught in, in, in between and, presi and present uh, hygiene problems. We have a computer, computerized uh, system, interact, voice-activated menu system, where it's, it's sort of like HAL, the computer in, 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 in Space, uh, what was it? Uh, space Odyssey, the first one, uh, where the computer talks to you, tells you how to prepare food. It also tells very silly jokes, uh, asks riddles, and... and uh, and it keeps track of the inventory that's being used, and it keeps track of how much uh, of different foods that people are consuming and, and their, caloric, their caloric intake and so on. The racks in the space station and the functional units are designed to pivot out. They, they pivot out of the wall. The principal reason for this is, is that we're, one of the concerns we have is, is meteorites and space debris. If the meteorite penetrates the pressure hull, we've, we've got to be able to access the hull very quickly to patch it against a leak. We hope if, if, if there is a penetration, it's a very small one because a, a, any, anything of any size would be catastrophic. In a way, it's easier than underwater pressurized systems because we have a vacuum on the outside and pressure on the inside, which means we can put the patch on from the inside. If you have an underwater facility, it's harder to get the patch on. You have to go outside to put the patch on effectively. So, but we do have to have ways of maintaining the system. We, uh, we don't use convection ovens in space. We use uh, contact ovens or use microwave ovens. Interesting thing without, without gravity is we don't, well, there are a lot of interesting things. One is that we don't have convection of heat. Light air doesn't rise because there's no heavy air. And so uh, we don't have, also we don't have convectional currents to, to move things away. If, if when you're sleeping, you can, you can have an accumulation of carbon dioxide outside of your face because it's, it's not moving through convection. And uh, you're breathing your old carbon dioxide unless we have good circulation of air inside the, inside the space station to, 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 move, to move the airflow. Uh, one of the advantages of this is that any lost item winds up in the air filter the next day that becomes the collection place for all the loose paper clips and pencils and so on. When, when we design things in space, we, don't, we tend not to use paper clips, however, or nuts and bolts. We like to use latches when possible because anything small will drift away. It's not like working on your workbench at home or your, your desk at your office where if you put your pencil down, it stays there. Things, things tend to float away. Uh, Jerry Carr, who was the commander of the third Skylab mission and who's one of our consultants, said he knew he was back on Earth when he tried to, he tried to uh, park his shaving cream 
container in the air at his kitchen at his bathroom sink and it fell to the floor <laughs> you also learn you also learn that people can adapt very quickly to space and, and, and zero gravity however one of the one of the considerations is that we don't we, we try to facilitate their adaptation we try to orient things even though we can use ceilings and, and floors and we can we can change we can do some very exotic interior designs unless we have some rational uh, design where people know where the where the floor is and where the ceiling is, people can get very confused as to which way is down and up. And that, that confusion is particularly critical at a time of an emergency when somebody's at a workstation or going to a workstation and they might go in upside down and flick the switch the wrong way or and so on. Also concern for kicking switches and also you know inadvertently because people tend not to walk, they tend to push off and float from one area to another uh, provisions for, whereas locomotion is very important. We don't need stairs to go from one level to another. We do need restraint systems to hold people when they're when they're where they want to be. And uh, we have the advantage we can move very massive articles. The remote manipulator system on the space station, which is that big arm that the Canadians built on the outside that can maneuver a 60,000 pound payload with no effort at all, can barely lift its own weight on Earth. And so you can manipulate very large, very massive items. The problem is stopping where you go when you get where you're going, because you still have inertia. And so you can you can pick up something very large and move it, but the problem is stopping when you get where at your destination. You don't go careening into a wall with something. So I'm just I'm just telling you these things to say that there's there's really a lot of special considerations, uh, largely due to gravity. There's also a lot of special considerations. Because you're bringing your environment with you. You're bringing your air supply. The air is very precious. It's not like in this building where you're leaking air from the, out, from the inside of the building to the outside. And more importantly, we're getting fresh air from the outside into the building. Uh, in our architecture on Earth, we use materials that, like carpeting, synthetic materials that, that off-gas formaldehydes and other materials that we're breathing. The thing that keeps us from being poisoned to death is the fact that our buildings are pretty leaky. Uh, if you want to be safer, you can go outside and sit next to the freeway, but that's often not practical from the standpoint of pollution. So we, we don't worry about dumping a lot of poisons into our environment because we think our environment's unlimited. In space, not so. Anything you put into that air, con air conditioning system, air containment system, is going to come back at you later. And so we're, we're very concerned about materials we use, flammability, safety, hygiene, many, many kinds of issues. This just simply shows a storage system. Oops, I'll go back. This shows the storage system uh, for the galley, and, and one of the nice things too is we can store things in drawers that we pull out. Things will, you know, we can, we can store things vertically or horizontally. It doesn't really make any difference. Uh, important thing is to utilize every every square foot every square inch that we can, every cubic inch as, as carefully as, as, as possible to conserve on space. The sleeping quarter, whoops, did it again. The sleeping quarters tend to be rather small. Uh, this is sort of the, the Gucci version we designed for a, for a Japanese exhibit that we designed and built that went to Japan about a year ago. But basically, this will give you an idea. We have a sleeping bag attached to a wall. We have a we have a computer workstation. We have a video cassette recorder, a television monitor, which becomes kind of your home study work workbench as well as interactive communication throughout the space station. Uh, personal storage areas. Uh, these have not been completely designed and approved yet. There's been many concepts developed for the sleeping quarters. They have to isolate smells that are objectionable that are coming from other areas. They have to isolate noise. They have to provide uh, temperature control by the occupant. Uh, one of the things we've been urging is that we use lots of fabrics in space, both because they're, they're soft, they're very tactile. It's a way of bringing color into the, into the facility. Much of the objection with, with Skylab was, was focused on the drabness of the colors. And 
and the concern for the human factors, the human conditions, is becoming much more operative. Uh, we'll probably use hang up sleeping compartments where uh, instead of drawers, where in space you have a jack-in-a-box effect. If you open the drawer, everything goes floating out and becomes entangled uh, somewhere else. Uh, it's nicer, in many cases, to have hang-up bags with pockets. And so you store things in the pockets and you reach in uh, to, to get what you want. Some of these pockets may have transparent windows on the outside. And on Skylab, they use lots of bungee cords to hold things. Bungee cords are good, except that when you, you're floating by and you kick one, everything goes, again, scattering uh, around and so on. But securing things in place is, is, uh, is a major consideration. Hand washes. When you, when you wash your hands, uh, you can't use a normal sink because the water would just be splashing all over the place. If you have a, a shower, uh, Again, if you open the sh first of all, the, sh the water, water isn't very smart. It doesn't take orders well. It, it, it wants to go sp without gravity. It just keeps bouncing around inside, inside the shower. And so you have to have air currents to, to force the water down into the drain. And also, you need to have a way of, of cleaning the water out of the shower, containing the water, so that when you open the shower, the water doesn't go out into the crew compartment and get into the equipment and so on. This is a shower we designed that has a, a vacuum bar on the inside. And so after you're take, done taking a shower, you, you move the vacuum bar around the inside. It vacuums out the inside of the shower. Then you open the door and get out. So there's a lot of little widgets and inventions that, that uh, we're involved with with space architecture. There's no suites catalog where you can order the parts. Uh, you, you kind of have the opportunity to, to design everything pretty much from, pretty much from scratch. This always makes an interesting discussion. I, I prefer not to, to uh, if you have any questions, let's hold them to the end. How do you do it in space uh, without gravity? Um, clever people are working on this problem. Uh, clue, it works with directed airflow. But, but uh, we have toilets. Uh, the one on Skylab worked well. The one on the shuttle hasn't worked very well. When they don't work, you got a serious, serious problem. Uh, this is this is the shower. Uh, the, sorry, this is the toilet that has has a, a neat has a thigh restraint system. It keeps you anchored in place. This is one we we design. Uh, this is a subject for at least one or two lectures. Medical facilities, uh, we, did, we did some of the early planning requirement definition for the medical facility for the space station. It's called a health maintenance facility. Uh, right now that work is being done by McDonnell Douglas. We're not involved with it recently, but uh, big question of, of medical, medical issues. What happens if somebody's injured? What happens, to, what happens if someone has to be isolated from the rest of the crew? What happens if somebody dies? What do you do with the body? Uh, you deep freeze it outside, tether it to a you know to an airlock. Uh, do you do you, do you maintain it in, in a refrigerated state on board? You know, there's there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of important questions that have to, that have important political ramifications that have to do with with medical issues. Uh, what what level of emergency do you attempt to respond to? At what point do you try to just just sort of stabilize the patient until until you can return them to Earth? What, at what point do you try to do an onboard intervention? There's a lot of uh, computer links and communication links that have to be considered so that even lay people can perform uh, minor medical uh, treatments if necessary. What if what if the onboard doctor is the one that's that's incapacitated? You have a very small crew that has to to attend to a lot of different requirements. Oops. This is uh, an early prototype developed by McDonnell Douglas, I believe, for, uh, for the space station. It, but it just shows the idea of 
plug in patient restraint systems. Uh, there's new digital uh, systems now that are replacing x-ray systems which are very heavy and, and this is quite an interesting area of technology. As we think of longer missions in space, we, which, which extend beyond the, this, the few months that Americans have been in space and even beyond the year that the Soviets have been in space, we really become concerned about the deconditioning effect of weightlessness. And we may be seeing some facilities in low Earth orbit that, are, that rotate to create artificial gravity. This is a concept for an artificial gravity space station that we developed at SIXA, where, where it rotates. This is a, the, the solar power system. These are modules very much like space station modules placed at two positions on this boom, one at the one-sixth gravity position, which, e which equates to the moon, one at a one-third gravity position that, that equates to Mars, and for a counterweight on the other end, we propose to use water storage. But this is one concept for an artificial gravity station. There's a good deal of controversy now, or at least it's inconclusive, as to whether we, we need to provide artificial gravity for, say, a mission to Mars that might last two and a half or three years. Uh, many people believe that we do, because if, if we don't, the, the astronauts or cosmonauts, by the time they reach Mars, may not be in any condition to do any, any, any real work. And they may not be able to even survive the reentry forces when they return to Earth. So there's a very real question about how do we sustain people without artificial gravity? What level of artificial gravity is necessary to maintain, maintain people in a healthy state? And we may use lunar base, the one-sixth gravity, as sort of a test bed for addressing this question, learn more about the levels of gravity required for, for a Mars mission. This is our variable gravity research facility that we proposed. You might be interested to know these are, these are computer-aided design drawings, CAD drawings, uh, not, not photographs of a model. Yep, I'm going backwards here. And we might have such facilities that are rotating facilities that actually actually go to Mars. They wouldn't look like this exactly, but but uh, but this is uh, I'll show you a concept for one later. As we think about Mars, going to Mars, uh, we're going to have systems that are very, very massive. It'll be probably the most ambitious and expensive enterprise ever embarked upon by the human species. And uh, the, the key question is, is right now revolves around propulsion systems. What kind of propulsion systems do, will we use to go to Mars? Will we, can we use the, the moon? As, as a supply place for getting oxygen as an, oxi as an oxidizer for the propulsion systems to go to Mars. Would, might, moon, might the moon become a, a launching area to go to Mars? Because uh, the gravity well from Earth is very strong. It takes a lot of propulsive energy to get from off the Earth to go into space, but it takes much less to go, to, to go into, into uh, orbit from Mars, from, uh, sorry, from the moon. So we may be seeing some very large industrial operations on the moon uh, to support the, the advanced planetary programs. So these might be hydrogen oxygen systems fueled from the moon. This is, this is another approach to providing artificial gravity. It's an artificial gravity, oops, did it again. Uh, artificial gravity sleeper, we call it. We, we designed and built this at Bell and Trotty based upon a concept developed at, the, at, at MIT, which is a, it's, it's like a revolving, it's a revolving platform about, I think it's about 18 feet in diameter. Four people can sleep on it for, for or spend, spend several days on this, on this rotating platform. It spins, spins rather rapidly up to about three gravities at the feet. And whatever, of course, if you get three, three gravities at the feet, you get about half that, about one and a half gravities at the waist. But it pulls the fluid, body fluids back down to the feet. And people can actually exercise in this. And there, 
I don't have photographs of it. We, we actually built, and this is operating now, in the Texas Medical Center in Houston, where we're doing, where, where the medical center is doing experiments on effects of artificial gravity. One of the interesting things about this is that the head is very near the center of pivot, and you don't have the Coriolis effect. Your head is so, so near the center of rotation that when you're on it, you have virtually no sensation of moving at all. Unless if your eyes are uncovered and you can see the light of the room going around or, or whatever, uh, then, then you would have a clue. But if you're on it, if you knew you were moving, you wouldn't know which direction you were moving until you put your arm up and then the, and then the centrifugal force would, would affect your arm. But, but it's, it's quite possible that rather than rotating the space station, which is very, very complicated business in terms of how it affects a whole lot of other things, we may rotate the people on board the space station and particularly on, on, on board a Mars craft. We've been working with uh, astronaut Buzz Aldrin, uh, who is a consultant to us on, on some, some advanced structures for uh, supporting advanced missions to the moon or Mars. The space station, as you may recall, that big truss was very flat, very, very, very two-dimensional. And if we want to build structures in orbit, uh, and we want to then move those structures to another orbit so that they're sustaining uh, propulsive loads, then we need to start thinking about other kinds of structural geometries. And Buzz Aldrin is, is very interested in this subject, uh, very, very interested in the subject. This is a project we did with him, the concept relating to a, a, what we call a space port. It's, a, it's, it's like an orbiting... Uh, maintenance facility to put it, be put into low Earth orbit that would do servicing on vehicles that are going to, to the Moon or Mars. And this is, and the modules inside would be very much like space station modules. This view shows, shows, uh, modules very much like the modules on Space Station Freedom, so we would use some of the same inventory of parts from the space station and now use it as a space operations center, a facility to support advanced missions uh, where you're refueling vehicles that are going to Mars and you're doing servicing of, uh, of equipment that breaks down in orbit. Going to the moon, incidentally this is uh, a view that maybe some of you will witness firsthand. We have we have a, a problem. Uh, I shouldn't just say the moon, but but Mars and the moon. And there's there's a there's a problem that I think is one of the most challenging ones for designers. Is is the problem of solar radiation and galactic radiation. We know very little effects about the effects of radiation even on Earth. Uh, we know very little about what safe radiation dosages are, and we seem to keep revising those, those estimates. But when we get into space, particularly, uh, it's not so bad in low Earth orbit where we have the ge geomagnetic field of the Earth and we have an atmosphere to protect us, but when we get outside of, when we get outside of our Earth uh, atmosphere, particularly as we go through the Van Allen belts and we get out into open space, radiation is, is a significant problem. Uh, it's a particularly serious problem during periods of, of, of high solar activity when there are major proton storms on the moon associated with periods of solar flares. And during these periods, uh, if you have the, the misfortune of being uh, in a spacesuit or being on a lunar base, remote from the facility, uh, it's, a le it's a really life-threatening situation. These major solar storms occur about twice every 11 years, so the probabilities, if you're on a long mission of encountering one, are, are significant. The problem is you, you can't simply add shielding to a spacecraft because the last thing you want to add to a spacecraft is, is, is weight because you have to launch it. So we began looking at other ways of providing radiation protection, for example, using stored water that you're going to use for consumption on the spacecraft as, as a water barrier around the, around the spacecraft and using the hydrogen in the water as, as a way of protecting yourselves. 
as we go to the moon, uh, one of the popular approaches to providing radiation protection is to use lunar soil, which is called regolith. Whoops, excuse me. There's so many gadgets here. Uh, using lunar soil over the modules to provide a thermal shield, to provide meteorite protection, but more than anything else, to provide radiation protection around the modules. Now there's there, there's some problems because once you put the first module in place, how do you get the second one in place? Uh, how do you land modules on the moon? How do you transport them? The logistics becomes quite quite challenging. One of the uh, this this is an early con SIXA concept for uh, developing a lunar base, which is basically using space station type modules. Uh, now they're in a one sixth gravity environment in creating a, a, a containment structure to support regolith lunar soil over the modules. This, I think it's, it's quite predictable that the first lunar bases will be modular. They will use modules brought from Earth, pre-checked pre out, landed on the moon, and, and very readily set up for that purpose. As we progress with lunar base development, it's quite likely I think we're going to see the use of inflatable structures. There's been a lot of advancements in inflatable technologies. We're, we're most of us familiar with Kevlar that's used for bulletproof vests, which has a very high penetration resistance, very high strength. Uh, but we need to probably use most of these materials as, as, as composite materials, as sandwiched materials that that have a, a lot of characteristics that we need. They, the outer portion of the material, the outer layer, needs to be a layer that will not be degraded by heat, or that will not be degraded by ultraviolet radiation, that will not be uh, affected by thermal contraction and expansion, uh, something that will be very durable and reliable. Internal layers, of course, have to, be, have to have very strong tensile capabilities. They need to have very good thermal protection capabilities. Internal layers have to be layers that protect the crew from off-gassing of toxic materials and have to have uh, protection from flammability and smoke. So through, through applying these sandwich type construction approaches uh, and some of the new material technologies, we can get, begin to do things like create inflatable structures. Here, this, here the membrane is not shown, but this is an idea where we we create, a, we create an artificial crater on the moon. We may not be able to find one that's, that's there, that's properly dimensioned and conformed. But uh, we might do this with a, with a detonation, with a point, with a shaped detonation charge. Uh, bring, bring the interior elements up in airlocks, position on either side of the crater, build the infrastructure, build the, the internal structure, and then essentially inflate a, inflatable enclosure around it that provides the pressure hull for the, for the space station. This is only one concept. There are many, many other possibilities. But the use of inflatable structures is now very popular within NASA. There are a number of organizations have studied it. Goodyear did a lot of studies on the subject years ago. And, and we've been working on this for about 13 years. It's, it's uh, becoming quite a popular activity to look at inflatables. This shows uh, maybe potentially what, what such an inflatable structure might look like. This one's about 90 feet in diameter. And the, the ribs here are only to, to define the boundaries of the inflatable. They're not actually structural ribs. Although they might be cables that are part of the tensile structure of the, of the membrane. It slides sideways, but I guess it doesn't. Well, I guess it does matter. We're on the moon now. We have one sixth gravity, so we might we might also build advanced structures using combinations of modules like space station, and, along with inflatables. These are modules where, in this case, we have modules like space station modules, and we have a circulation tube on top to provide dual egress in case there's a, a problem with the module. You can escape through this tube and go to other locations. Uh, this is this is a concept that, that we developed at SIXA, and it just shows the example of a possible growth geometry for building a modular inflatable system. 
where we have interior areas that are inflatable in combination with, with smaller areas where uh, living quarters, laboratories, and so on. This is just one of many possibilities uh, for such structures. It's possible that these inflatable membranes might ultimately be made of glasses mined on the moon. Interesting factors when you get into uh, the lunar environment and, and any space environment is how it affects materials. In space, when you don't have moisture present and, you, and you're producing glasses, anhydrous glasses that don't have moisture, the glasses are very, very strong. They are perhaps uh, 10 times or more stronger than steel or the strongest steel alloys. And so we now have, have glass materials that are performing very much like metals. And the notion is that we can create, we can, we can weave these, these glasses into fabrics like fiberglass or we can use them as structural elements. Much of our study recently has been looking at, at use of indigenous lunar materials such as glasses, basalts, cast basalts, which is actually ceramics. I notice you have a Kalili studio going on here, and that's, that's neat because uh, nobody's done more with uh, ceramic structures than, uh, than uh, Nadir Kalili. And, and you find that we may be harking back to some technologies on the moon that, are, that we've, we've sort of lost. Uh, the cast basalt is used, has been used extensively in Czechoslovakia and, other, and some other countries for making plumbing systems and a lot of other systems. But I think as we, and as we go to the Now addressing, again, the radiation issue, the question is how do we, if we want to use uh, lunar soil, regolith, to cover a module, how do you move this soil? For one thing, lunar soil is very fine, very abrasive. It will attach itself to anything that's exposed. It will get into mechanical joints, fittings. It will cover window surfaces. And uh, it's, it's, it's very abrasive, uh, very, very uh, problematical on the, on the lunar surface. So first of all, moving, moving the soil is a problem. Containing it to, re to reduce dust is also a problem. We, we proposed at one time that we use uh, what we call soil packs or, or uh, bags to cover a module rather than using just loose soil. But I think you can tell from this photograph that, that we're talking about moving an awful lot of material when we do that. And so we began looking at automation robotic systems that can do some of these tasks for us. A more recent lunar-based project, again, using uh, lunar, lunar uh, modules. Incidentally, we've recently installed a full-size space station mock-up module, module outside of our facility at the University of Houston, sitting on our lawn now. I think we're the only university with a space station on this lawn. And we're going to use the space station module as a reference volume for planning lunar base interiors. So we can do full-size mock-ups and we can, we can run some simulations, uh, putting some of our students inside of it with their designs so they can do some post-occupancy evaluations on their own work after a week or two of confinement. This shows an erectable system. Uh, surrounding the modules with, with membranes that are stretched within these, these frames to retain the regolith, the soil, over the modules and to keep the dust controlled. <coughs> We've looked a lot at module sizes, and this is kind of subject for a whole other lecture, but, we, but the space station module with a 15-foot diameter is the smallest size you can put a 95-percentile uh, American male in, which is baseline maximum for requirement for a space station. 15-foot uh, diameter module, whether it's small, is, is really quite economical. We've looked at larger size modules. This is about 22 feet in diameter which enables a two-level configuration. Uh, that's also possible. In, in many respects, it's not as efficient as the smaller size modules. And it would be more difficult to maneuver on the lunar surface. It would require larger landing systems, larger transportation maneuvering systems. That's kind of a back view of, of such a module. We'll also be looking at other types of ancillary structures frame structures, tent structures. Tents might be very useful for, uh, for example, when you have a landing, 
a landing pad, the landing vehicles kicking up rocks and ejecta, ways of protecting the base and, and inhabited areas from rocks penetrating pressure hulls and so on. Uh, we may use uh, tent type structures for, for debris screens. Many types of structures that, that can be explored for space. Emphasis being on weight, reliability, and reducing the, the human time during, for construction to the absolute minimum. We may be supporting a lot of other activities on the moon. We may have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, produce, we might be producing lunar oxygen. Much of the soil on the moon is as much as 40% oxygen that can be, that can be obtained by, by heating the soil. So there's a great abundance of oxygen. The, th the thing we have not found on the moon is hydrogen. And without hydrogen, we can't make water. And so uh, we, we probably we're, if we had a launch system from the moon, and well, and certainly we would have to import water either from Earth, or it's been proposed that we can get water from asteroids, or that we can get water, we can get hydrogen from, from uh, uh, Phobos and Deimos, the moons of Mars. But we may see some fairly significant industrial facilities on the moon. We might also see f facilities that collect helium-3 that would be used in future, heli in f future fusion reactors in the event that fusion power becomes uh, reduced to a practical science. This is a, a concept uh, It shows a lot of different types of structures. It's a hypothetical lunar base. You can see some modules, inflatable structures. Etc. Industrial plants. This is a model designed by my partner that's been in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, if, you, if you've been there. One of our current interests and, and very strong interest now is in, in space analogs. We're doing a lot of work with, with Antarctic programs. We've been strong advocates for a what we call an Antarctic planetary test bed that would be an international facility designed to support upper atmospheric sciences. There would be a test bed for power systems, waste management systems, construction systems uh, on planetary surfaces. It would be an international model of cooperation based upon the, the, the precedents of the Antarctic treaties. Uh, this is something we've been proposing, promoting, researching for some time. And we're, we're seeing now recently a good deal of interest in the part of NASA and the National Science Foundation in moving in this direction. This is a proposal we did for an Antarctic planetary test bed. Uh, it's in one of the publications that we've left with this school. And it, uh, so we're, we're looking at erectable structures, deployable structures that can be used in Antarctica. We're also planning an international conference next year at the University of Houston that deals with harsh environments. We'll have uh, design in, in, in extreme environments. We'll have participants from all over the world representing as many disciplines as possible to look at relationships between space architecture, polar programs, underwater facilities, offshore rigs, deserts, jungles, and also looking at uh, conditions where you have an earthquake or some natural disaster or a Chernobyl-type nuclear disaster and you need to provide emergency shelters, emergency medical interventions, and so on. There's much to be learned, we think, through uh, looking at these, these analog situations. The transfer of technology is not just from space to the Earth, but it's also from Earth to space. So that really concludes uh, this very rapid uh, 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 discussion survey of some of the types of projects we've been involved with. Uh, I haven't gone into anything in, in any depth, uh, but providing there's time available, I would be very, very happy to, to uh, address any questions and comments you would have. Uh, for me, that's the most fun of this program. Thank you very much.
you. The question, as I understand it, is is what what can people do to prepare for uh, for training in the field of industrial design and architecture, or industrial design in in the, related to space? I didn't hear the. I used to head the graduate program in industrial design at the University of Illinois, and, and at that time I had contact with lots of other programs. It's been some time uh, since we've pursued industrial design per se. I think much of what we do in our program is really a marriage between industrial design and architecture, because we're dealing with microsystems for the most part. We're dealing with, very extensively with human factors, and you can see from these from this presentation, we're dealing with small environments. We're dealing with 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 uh, human machine interfaces and, and and so on. That it's it's both industrial design and architecture, and I'm not sure that the distinction means very much. But some of some of the students come in our program, they go through two years rather than one year because for the simple reason we offer a master of architecture degree. But, but certainly, I think the industrial designers are as well prepared for what we do as the architects are, which, which is pretty darn good. As far as, as, far as what you would do to prepare, I'd, I'd just find out what the good schools are for industrial design, and I'd, and I'd pursue that. Yes. Well, the, the question is, is a response to the kind of industrial appearance of a lot of the interiors, and, and, and the question, I guess, is, is, uh, is, this, is this a given, or what, what can be done to, uh, to, to perhaps break away from some of that kind of rigidity? Uh, the, I, think it's, I think it's a very valid point, and, and an interesting one. Uh, when we, with, with regard to the space station, and those are the views I showed of interiors, uh, the modularity of the system, you know, where, where you have interchangeable racks and, and units, where you're really fighting uh, weight and, and, and so on, where, where you have to be able to access all the parts for maintenance and so on, uh, is, is an awfully big driver in, in when, when you have to have cleanable surfaces and and you have to have non-inflammable materials, and so on, uh, has takes its toll upon uh, upon a lot of options. Uh, I think that, there, however, there's been a great deal of attention given to the human comfort issues in in the space station, uh, in terms of providing as as many amenities as 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 possible within within the tight constraints of weight and volume. Uh, a lot of concern for the operability of systems, and, and for example, with with regard to the to the galley, we've been planning, we've been we've done many many time motion studies of preparing menus and optimizing layout and and and, and inventory and storage and, and so on. Uh, I think there's a lot more that can be done. Uh, I mentioned, for example, I think we could reduce weight by not having as many hard walls. And, and, and we, we've gotten so much into the kind of modular mentality that we forget that if we have soft, soft materials, for example, we can possibly roll them up. We can open up spaces. We can, we can use materials that are, that, are, that are more human in color and response. We can provide people in the sleeping quarters, for example, with, with peel-off interiors that after their, after their mission, they bring the, their wall coverings back with them which is a good hygienic idea anyway. And then the next crew chooses their own interiors and brings them with them and, and installs them. Uh, there are a lot of constraints. There are a lot of reasons that, that things look the way they do. But I think there's, there's certainly avenues for, for uh, doing, doing things better. Our work is not just on the interior modules, but, 
but also you know the the overall architecture and mission planning and so on but but in order to, for us to really address the question and the issue that you're raising that's why we put a full-size mock-up outside of our, our building so we can build full-size interiors and really experience them and uh, attempt to be somewhat more creative and uh, with, with the interiors without without losing our credibility with our client which is NASA and they're going to be doing doing the same things in parallel with us and I think by by putting people in these closed environments for periods of weeks or or months, uh, we're going to get a lot of feedback that's going to you know, continue to drive the, the designs in a way that's going to be more humanistically acceptable. Yes? We're in contact with Biosphere 2 and, and have personal knowledge of, of the people and the program one of our one of our connections is through the International Space University, where we offer a space architecture program as part of the International Space University. Those of you who don't know about that should find out about it. It's, it's an incredible program. It's held in a different country every summer. Uh, it's mostly for postgraduates, but um, the Biosphere Two people participate in ISU and are one of the sponsoring organizations f for that. I've been out there a couple of times, and uh, impressed by the by the, um, uh, the scale and, and the determination that I see uh, operating there. You, you said you had two questions? The question is, you know, it's, a, it's, an, it's an observation on our dependence upon the shuttle as a delivery system, and I don't think anybody believes that 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 we can rely upon the shuttle as our primary delivery system. Uh, we're going to need. Uh, I think the emphasis. Uh, I think we've learned that, that we're going to have to go with expendable systems, expendable launch systems, whether they're derived from from the shuttle, or whether they're absolutely new systems. Is a, is a question we're seeing private companies now developing these 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 alternative systems including large and small companies uh, will they be energia size uh, heavy lift vehicles energy is not being used much so right now there's not much of a, a really demand for payloads of that size but certainly with the Mars program I think we're going to be looking at energy size launch launch systems uh, they're going to have to be very reliable um, you know, clearly, and, uh, I think another question you raised was, had to do with our cooperation with the Soviet Union. Uh, it's interesting to me that in the Houston area we see large billboards done by McDonnell Douglas and others that, that show the Mir spacecraft and the, and the caption is, shouldn't we be there too? The notion is, we're letting the Soviet Union get ahead of us in space and that's been a big incentive to, to try to push for the U.S. space program. Uh, I've been to the Soviet Union twice this year. I'm going again again uh, in November. I can tell you that the Soviet man program is in real problems right now uh, because of the general economic program problems in the Soviet Union as well as as because of the linkage in many pe Soviet people's minds between the Soviet military programs and the Soviet space programs, which uh, c sort of casts a, a, a shadow up on the space programs. So, that, so we're not going to, first of all, be able to use the Soviet programs much longer, probably, as, as, as the rallying cry to say, shouldn't, shouldn't we be there, too? They may very well be cutting back on their manned programs. With regard to international cooperation, I think there's kind of a mentality within, within our, our government that is cautious about too much dependence upon any other nation. For example, if you embark upon a program like a Mars program, it's going to have to be planned over a period of decades. It's going to be very, very expensive. And then there's some international thing that happens. 
you know, some breakdown in, in, in relations between countries or some economic problem that affects the ability of one of the partners to deliver, suddenly your whole program, this whole, this whole plan is vulnerable to collapse because some of the critical elements didn't get delivered or won't be delivered. And there's, I think, I think that concern for the, inter, the downside risks of, of interdependence along with the kind of an attitude that shouldn't we do it ourselves as a national prestige item, it's the American flag on the moon kind of mentality, uh, works against that. On the other side, the enormous costs of going to space, I think the, norm, the enormous payoffs in terms of international benefits of joint cooperation, I predict are going to over, you know, outweigh you know, the objections. And so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yes? I have not. And uh, in, our, in our work, that's, 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 that's important. Uh, since, since we have not experienced weightlessness, I, I tried to fly in the KC-135 that flies parabolas. Incidentally, that company that operates that, uh, Payload Systems Integration, is owned by the company we started, Space Industries Incorporated. So we have a lot of our experiments have flown on that, on the KC-135. We rely a lot upon the experience of people who have been in space, you know, Jerry Carr and Bill Polk and others, particularly space, particularly uh, uh, Skylab people who have, who have extended periods in space. And we rely an awful lot upon the videos uh, of, of uh, particularly the Skylab experience, but also more recently the shuttle experience, where we can, we can sort of vicariously observe things that are going on and, and, and uh, so it's a kind of a combination of uh, people's experiences in, who, who critique our work as well as uh, kind of observation vicariously of, of watching the films and so on. That, that's where we get our where we get our data. Yes. I don't know. I, I'm not privy to that. I, I, I just I don't know the history of that. I'm sorry. I uh, I sense that uh, the time is about right about finished. And uh, once again, let me thank you for the Im invitation, opportunity to be here. Uh, if any of you have some questions, uh, things you want to discuss, uh, I'm certainly available and very happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming.